Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. It is good to be back in the Lord's house among believers in Christ. We're going to be uh, dealing with the theme this evening of being risen with Christ. And uh, we've been studying the book of Colossians and, and um, the Apostle Paul is trying to help the Christians at Colossae. There's been false doctrine that are coming in about secret knowledge and, and secret mysteries and having to get into this uh, secret wisdom. We found out that Jesus is all wisdom. In Him is hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. And we are complete in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is sufficient. Jesus alone. We don't have to be a part of any secret club or secret membership society. God, uh, in Him, we are complete. And uh, there are no secrets to those who follow Him. Uh, he, there may be secrets that the world doesn't understand because there are things in this Bible that are spiritually dis understood, spiritually discerned. You and I didn't know this Bible before we were saved. And without the help of the Holy Spirit of God, we still don't know it. But He who lives inside of us helps us understand the Scriptures. And this is something the world doesn't have. But when you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit, and He is the author of this book, and He helps you understand this book. Colossians chapter number 2, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time together this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the church uh, and the needs of the church. Help each and every one as you see fit and according to your will and way. Father, there were many, uh, many requests and some with burdened hearts, heavy hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would touch those and meet those in a special way. Father, be with the service this evening, the rest of the service, be with the teenagers next door. Pray that uh, your word would go forth and accomplish that which you'd have it to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, again, we talked about the great conflict that Paul had because there was trouble coming in on every side. And lest we get comfortable in, in our good church, a solid foundation in our Christian upbringing, the things that we understand to be so, let's be aware that the devil is still trying to throw in doctrine that's not according to the Word of God. And we've got to be careful, be on guard against that. The best, uh, the best way to tell what's counterfeit is to know the truth through and through. We, we've talked a little bit about that. There is surety in Christ. There's sufficiency in Christ. Christ is, Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. He is the fullness that we need. And He is the fullness that we have because we have the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything that, that we need for this life in wisdom and living we have available to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, so this week we're going to talk about our present condition, our precious Savior. I'm giving you an outline so you can follow along later. We're going to talk about uh, what we share with the Lord Jesus Christ and what we are looking for, okay? So, Colossians chapter number 2, let's jump down to verse number 10, pick up where we left off last week. It says, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Let's go ahead and jump back to verse number 1 so we get the full context of everything. <clears throat> for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joined in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Remember last week we said that anything that pulls us away from Christ is not good. We ought to stay away from it, stay clear of it. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. What were, was the sign that the Jews had? It was a sign of circumcision, right? They were separate. They were separated unto God, a separate people, and that was an outward sign for them, the sign of circumcision. We'll see another um, 
another picture here in just a moment. It says, In whom also are ye circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So it's obvious to, to reading this that he's not talking about the physical, uh, physical manner of, of circumcision. He's talking about the heart, the spiritual manner of circumcision, that we, are, we have put off the body of our sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him, here's the other picture, in baptism. It's another sign, right? has nothing to do with salvation, but it's a sign. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So you can see in the context that neither circumcision nor baptism saves a person. They're, they're pictures. They're signs. They're, they're for, um, well, for pictures, for, for understanding. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. <clears throat> So let's, let's, let's stop before we go too far. Verse number 10 says, And ye are complete in Him. Our present condition, we are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, uh, we're, it's not in another, we're not complete in another man, in any other message. There's no other message that we're complete in. There's no other creed that we're complete in. It's not, just, it's not Jesus plus another message or this Word of God plus another add-on or another Bible. It's, it's Jesus and Him alone that we are complete. We are set apart unto the Lord. Circumcision was for the Jews. It was set apart. We're set apart for, unto God. We are dead under our sins. Verse 12, we read that. We are forgiven from our trespasses. Verse 13, we read that. You being dead in your sins. Remember when, uh, for, for some of us, for, for some, it was a long time ago when you were a sinner. For others, it was just recent that you were a sinner separated from God. Now, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. We still sin, we still mess up, but we're, we are ch children of God, um, sons and daughters of God, if we've been birthed in the family of God, through faith in the Son of God. But if you'll remember, whenever that time was, before you were saved, you were a sinner that was dead in your trespasses and sins. We had no hope. There was... Uh, in fact, let's go on, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. You know, <clears throat> it was customary during this day and age for the, uh, the accused, the one that was going to hang on the cross, to have some uh, the accusations written down on paper and then nailed to the cross so that people passing by would see why that person was hanging on the cross. We know Jesus had a superscription up above him, this is the king of the Jews. Um, but watch, really, and in, in the, the spiritual reality of, of what was hung to his cross. Look at verse 14 again. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Think about this. What was against you and me? What was given to us? God gave, as God gave several commandments, but as a rule, as a law, he gave ten commandments, Right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Um, if we break any one of those commandments, we are a transgressor. We have broken the commandments of God and stand in need of God's judgment. We, we stand before God guilty. That's the, the Bible says in Exodus 31, 18 and Deuteronomy 9, 10. You want to turn there but that the Ten Commandments that God gave was written with the finger of God. It was engraved in tablets of stone. Remember the first time when Moses came down from the mount, he threw the stone tablets and he, and he broke them because he saw what the children of Israel were doing. They had forsaken God and worshiping a golden calf. And it was just 40 days earlier, they had been uh, with Moses and all the things they'd seen that God had done for them. But uh, God gave it again. He wrote it down again with, with his finger. But that stood against us. Look what happened to it. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to whose cross? His cross. In reality, when Jesus was dying on the cross for our sins, not for his sins, that was the accusation that they wrote. But, but in reality, when he was there hanging on the cross, that was my ordinance that was that he was hanging for it was my transgression that he was hanging for it was uh, my thing my sins that put him there on the cross so Jesus took my sins and nailed it to his cross he suffered for my sins he paid the debt for my sins I could never pay him he paid the debt 
and now that he paid the debt and I have received him by faith, then now my ordinances, my, my, the handwriting of ordinances against us is blotted out. The transgression is blotted out. The sins are remembered no more in his account. Isn't that a blessing? Now, I remember the things that I've done before I was saved. You remember the things you, you did before you were saved, but he doesn't remember them. He says, what sins are you talking about? There's no record of those. They've been wiped clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. He says, verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I love the language of the Bible. He said he made a show of them openly. That's victory. That's being confident in your victory. There was a death, hell, and the grave could not contain the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let me back up real quick and read these verses. These are, just, these are important. Isaiah 53, 6, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He, he never sinned, but he laid on himself our sins to die in our place. John three eighteen and 5, 24 both have this wording. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. See, before you and I were saved, we were standing condemned before God. But now that we've received him by faith, we're no longer condemned before God. What a blessing that is. So that's our present condition. Now, our precious Savior, victorious over sin, never sin. You know, you realize that he was 100% God, but 100% man. That he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So though, he was, though the temptation of sin was there, he never committed any sin whatsoever. Um, he was sinless. Then after... And we're, we're going to get to that after he rose again from the grave. Let's, let's turn over to Romans chapter number 6. Hold your place here. Turn to the left. Romans chapter number 6. Verse number 1. Just read a few verses down through here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized in his death? Again, there's the picture again of baptism. Being baptized into Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse, let's jump down to verse number 10. Some I want to get to. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. Then in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He died for sin. How many of you would agree with that? He died for my sin. You know what? He also died to sin. He, he now is in glorified body. Now there is no temptation to, to sin at all present with him. That is a glorious hope for you and for me who are now saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But there still is temptation out there to do wrong and to sin. We need the encouragement of one another. We need a good church family to help one another, pray for one another. We need the help of God Almighty living through us day by day by day to stay away from those sins. But there's coming a day when we reach heaven that we'll be delivered from the presence of sin, we'll be delivered forevermore from the power of the, the, the lure, allure of sin. We won't have to deal with that anymore. We'll be dead to sin. Back over to Colossians chapter number 2. And then Romans chapter 6 talks about that too. So it's a good reference. If, if you need a little more reference, Romans chapter number 6, we're not going to go through that. We don't have time for that. And you'll run me out if we go through that, all that tonight. Um, I promise you. So Colossians chapter number 2, it's, it's talking about uh, being dead to sin. Now, you and I still have this flesh that we carry about with us. So we still have these struggles, these temptations that go about with us, but God has given us the power to overcome those things. Before we get to that, though, remind you that, again, the Apostle Paul is trying to clear up with them that salvation is not by becoming a Jew, not in Judaism. It's not in circumcision. It's not in becoming a part of a secret member of some kind of secret club um, with secret knowledge. Let's keep reading it and we'll, 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 we'll see this come out here in our scripture. Verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you. You remember, see, all this was part of the law. The Jews held to, to these things. He's saying, these things aren't bad to hold to, but there's a greater law that's working in you now. 
Instead of thou shalt not kill, the greater law is love thy neighbor as thyself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, it goes more above than just not killing them, right? There's, there's people that I would like to strangle, but I, re, I, I restrain myself. Um, but I would go further if I love them as myself. So there's a greater law working in, when, in us. Uh, verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Again, Jesus is sufficient. The Son of God, God Almighty, is, is sufficient and is alone worthy to be worshipped and admired. We don't have to pray to an angel or pray to an intermediary, pray to, to someone else. We pray directly to God. If an angel were to come and visit us, which they don't do that now, not in this administration, we would not bow down to them or worship them. You remember when John was given the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, and he fell down at, at the man that was giving him a certain message. It was an angel. He said, don't do that. I am, I, I, I'm like you. He said, worship God. He's reminded him, don't worship me. I'm just like you. We're going to worship God. So a, a true angel, if there is an angel that comes to you and wants you to worship him, He's an angel of the devil. He's not an angel of God. So there are holy angels, heavenly angels, and there are angels that have fall, fallen with the devil and are following the devil. So let's just be clear in that, okay? And not uh, 18 again, so we get the whole context. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing when somebody gets a little bit of knowledge that they think they can run with it and they're, they're puffed up. I, I, I can turn on YouTube and watch how to build a doghouse. And if I'm not careful, I'll end the day by thinking, I can build my own house. This is pretty easy. A little bit of knowledge can, can really ruin you, can it? It can really go the wrong, wrong way in a hurry. I know there's a lot more to it than that, isn't it, Brother Gene? It's a little bit, right? So we've got to be careful. A little bit of knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. <laughs> Somebody, anybody else like that? I hear a lot of laughing out there. All right. A little bit of knowledge puff it up. So we've got to be careful about that. God doesn't hold secrets for just a select few other than those that are, being, that are close to him. If you want to know the secrets of God, he said, fine, they're open. They're, you're welcome to know the secrets. You're, you're welcome to know my heart. But you've got to follow me and be close to me. And I'll, and I'll reveal it to you. You want to be a select few. Okay. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Jesus is the head of the body. So he's re re referencing the church as a body. They have the head that controls everything. The head tells the arms what to do, tells the feet what to do. Um with which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Now look at this. This, you and I, physically are increasing as we eat, aren't we? we we're increasing either this way or this way. But, but what, is the, uh, what is the limiting factor here? We, we increase how? With the increase of God. There, God is infinite. So as God increases, we increase if we follow with Him. There is no limits to God. We discussed, I think this the other day, or at least I, I meant to, there's no limit to the grace of God. There's no limit to the comforts of God. Say, well, God comforted so-and-so. He may comfort you in a completely different manner, but there's, you won't exhaust God's comfort. And you won't exhaust God's supply of grace, or God's supply of anything, because God is inexhaustible. And he who will increase you as we follow him. Now, now look at this. If Jesus is in his rightful place, and here at Pax Branch Baptist Church, we want to lift up Jesus and put him in his rightful place. Watch this. Who else has to be in their rightful place? That we do, the members, right? Which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together. I, again, I don't do knitting. I've seen Rachel do a little bit of knitting. She likes to do some of that stuff. And that's, that's tight, tightly woven, isn't it? Is that right? You've got crocheting, which is looser. See, I know a little bit. I pay attention. And knitting, which is a little tighter. But what, what he's saying is, he's saying we as, as members of the body of Christ are knit together. We're closer than we are physically 
here this evening. We're spread out a little bit this evening, but spiritually we're closer than that to one another. Um, when someone over here is going through our time and suffering and going through troubles, every member of the, of the body of Christ hurts with them and prays with them. Um, some to lesser degrees and some to more, more extent. Maybe um, there's things in your life that you've experienced and you can relate to that special need and you're touched a little bit more. But we all hurt, we all pray, and we all uh, are there to try to encourage and help. So Jesus is in his rightful place, and then you and I are in our, our place, in our church, family, helping one another, encourage one another. Having nourishment ministered, we get our nourishment from God. And we help one another. And it goes out this way. Increases with increase of God. He's inexhaustible. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ for the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. He's, he's not saying that there is a license to do whatever you want to after salvation. He's saying, just be careful. This is not part of salvation. A Christian should live as a Christian and stay away from certain things. Because your temple is the, the temple, or your body, rather, is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, which dwelleth in you. So you ought to be careful what you put into your body, what you allow in the eye gate, and the ear, the ear gate. You ought to be careful about that. Be saying, just be careful, that's not part of salvation. Which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Where did it come from? It came from, that, that particular doctrine came from man. It didn't come from God. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor, just the satisfying of the flesh. There was, a, there was another doctrine that was part of this that said if you um, set aside your body and, and uh, starved it in certain ways or, or restrained from certain things that you would grow more spiritual. We have, there's, there's religions out there today that are like that. Uh, if you seclude yourself and you restrain from certain things after a certain fashion, then you'll, you'll draw closer to the Lord. That's not true. How do you draw closer to the Lord? Well, you abstain from sin. You do do that. But then you also uh, draw close to God in His Word and through prayer and obey, o obey, obedience, so obeying His Word, obedience. Chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So Jesus should be preeminent in everything. Um, Romans 12, 1 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We talk about this. If someone's going to be grounded and not led away with false doctrine, they need to be grounded in the truth. Error or false doctrine gets a grip where truth is either not known or has not been obeyed. You think about this. Um, over the course of history, there have been select times when everybody on earth knew the truth. Think of the creation. Adam and Eve knew the truth. Think of their descendants. Somewhere, at some point in time, all of them knew the truth, but then they started leaving the truth. They started disobeying, and then there came a time when they had children, and they had children. They didn't know the truth anymore. They didn't know the gospel. And Noah, Noah and his family. When Noah got off the ark, he and his family, they knew the truth. There are flood legends all over the world that trace back to that, that sound similar to the Bible. They have their own different variations, but they all knew the truth at some point in time. You know what happens is, is um, generations get away from the truth. They start following their own path. That's why it's important for you and for me to stay in the way that God has brought us. Stay in, stay faithful to what God has done. See, um, and Pastor Vance, before leading up to his retirement, he, he taught on the book of Jude. And he said, earnestly contend for the faith. In every generation, the faith has to be contended for. All right, so we, we share, you and I, um, as Christians, share in the death of Christ. In this regard, we didn't die for our sins, but we are buried with Him. Romans 6 talks about this. Um, we read some of that. But now we are freed from the power of sin. There's still temptations, but we don't have to go out and commit sin. We have deliverance with the help of God, okay? But also, we should uh, view sin as God sees sin. God hates sin. His attitude towards sin, uh, he hates it. I don't think you and I 
often enough have that hatred for sin. We, we see the effects of it, and, uh, but we ought to hate it like he hates it. Not the sinner, because we are sinners saved by the grace of God. And those out there just need the Lord. We ought to hate the sin itself. Look at verse number 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I like that, I like that phrase that, that God says there. When Christ, who is our life. Christ is our life. When he shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It says, Mortify, therefore, put to death your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He's saying immorality, impurity, uh, uncontrolled passion, evil desire, and covetousness. You put, put those away. Put those to death. We're not to be brought under uh, that power anymore because we're free children of God. And, and that the, go back to chapter number, uh, same chapter, sorry, verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. So, so how do you get rid of those things? How do you put those things to death? Well, first of all, you get your eyes off of those things, and you lift your eyes upward, right? It says, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Don't allow for those things to get a foothold in your life. If you, if you uh, are going to a certain place, and uh, temptation is there that, that comes in and gets a foothold, then stay away from that place. Stay clear of that place. Don't try to invite those things in. Um, several years ago, there, there was a lot of preaching against television. Now, we have a television, and, but we, we don't have cable. There's not a whole lot on. But I'm not preaching against cable. If you have cable, but you need to make sure you can control it and turn it off or turn the channel if something comes on that shouldn't be on. Let's be careful what comes in. Well, it affects our heart. How do we keep our hearts clean and pure? Well, we remove the outside influences as, me, as best as we can to, to keep from getting a foothold, and we look towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift our affections uh, upward. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Romans 13, 14, it says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll, we'll get there. Hang on a second. Chapter number, uh, same chapter. Verse number 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. So do you remember uh, when you walked in that same pathway, but now you've been delivered from that, now you don't do that anymore. Verse number 8, But now ye also put off all these. And I said, We done told you some things we want you to put off, or, or, or to put to death, now I want you to put off these. These are attitudes of the heart. Anger, wrath, malice, Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So you and I as Christians have a new life. It's a transforming life. We have a new walk. Um, we also should have a new look, if that makes sense. Make, make sense. And it's not dressing up the outside. It's, it's the inside working itself out. It's the, the attitude toward others. See this? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. It's easy to get angry at people that they because they don't do things the way you want them to do it the way they think you should they should be done and I always use the illustration of going to the grocery store because that just that seems to be my weak point going to the grocery store waiting in line and and uh, it just I don't know there's so much there I guess I just I need to work on um, that's not my favorite place to go but anyway it's it's uh, easy to think you're super spiritual until you go to a place like that isn't it and something like that comes out until somebody calls, cuts you off in the middle of the road, middle of the aisle, it rams your buggy, or so on and so forth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. So we got some things we got to put off. So those things are still present with us. Our flesh is still there, but our attitude should be different. When you wake up with the Lord and you spend time with the Lord, you set your affection with the Lord. You may get bumped off that direction, but at least you're heading in the right direction in, in the first thing in the morning. And you ought to cultivate that throughout the day as needed. And have put on the new man. So you put off these things, but you put off these things to put on something else. Have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. These are barriers that the gospel crosses. Um, this is the 
a racial barrier that's crossed. We hear a lot about race today, but there's neither Greek nor Jew. Back then, that, that's all that the Old Testament um, Jews were concerned about. You're a Jew or you're not a Jew. But it said the gospel crosses that bridge. It brings everybody one under Christ. So that, that barrier is crossed. Religious barriers are crossed. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. So it doesn't matter. The, what matters is the heart. Have your heart been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Cultural barriers are crossed. Barbarian, Scythian, uh, bond nor free. Uh, social barriers are crossed. Are you a, a bond servant or are you free? It doesn't matter. One in Christ. But Christ is all and in all. So he says everybody, what category you were in, now you're in Christ. Now this is what you put on. Verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Aren't you glad you're, you're loved by the Father? Uh, sometimes I think we just need to let that sink in. That God loves you. Because He loves you and He is holy. He wants us to be holy. It should be easy to love Him back in return. She says, put on therefore bows of mercies. That's a lot different than being angry and uh, being uh, vengeful. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. That's restrained. Uh, the strength but having it restrained, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. See, the Lord would not have put that in here if, if He knew that we wouldn't need that forbearance and forgiving one another from time to time. But we all do things to, that, that we need that forbearance with one another, forgiveness with one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What's the secret? How do I forgive somebody else? So I just can't forgive him for that. Well, think about what God forgave you of and how Christ uh, paid for, for what God forgave you. As Christ forgave you, what did we do to him? So also do ye. And above all these things, this is the topping, this is the, the envelope that envelopes it all, put on charity, love, which is the bond of per perfectness. So how do we do all this? The answer goes back to Chapter 2, verse number 10, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He's the source of our strength. He's our help. Um, and I want to I get to this here in just a moment, but you and I can't expect to live a perfect, sinless life. We're not him, but we ought to strive to be as much like him as we can be. We ought to look to him for our strength and guidance. Verse number Four again, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Looking for the day of Christ. There ought to be an expectation looking for his return. Are you expecting him to return? Expecting him to come back? What If you are, our life should be a preparation for that day. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, and we're winding this down, says, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. When he comes, when he returns, I want him to see me busy doing his work, what he left me here to do. It involves, uh, it involves every part of us. So it sounds like a bunch of do's and don'ts, and it is to a certain extent, but it's not to be saved. It's just to live a holy and clean life so, so God can use us as he wants to use us. And you can't do it in your own strength. Or you'll fail and you'll get frustrated. You have to go to the Lord. That's why it's important to start the day with the Lord. Spend time with Him in prayer, in Bible reading. Say, God, help me today. And then stay with Him throughout the day. We come to um, fellowship one with another. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. When a member fails, we encourage them. We lift them up and we help them back. We restore them back. And we, all, we do all of that waiting for the Lord to return. Okay? That's all we have tonight. Let's stand with our head bowed and eyes closed. We'll be dismissed.